Okay. Um, Great. That was just a dry run. <laughs> yeah, hold on one sec. It is February 27th. We're recording, Dave. Yep, we're good. We're good. Okay, good. It is uh, now 631, calling the meeting, the Community Resources Committee of the Town Council to order at 631. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by Chapter 22 and 107 of the Acts of 2022, and extended again by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public is possible, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. And we, again, we have a quorum and we have all attendees. Good. Okay. Um, there are no public hearings tonight, but we can open with public comment. Uh, public comments on Just matter. The point of order. Sorry, Pam. Uh, you have to check to make sure all attend all, all committee members can hear and be heard. Thank you. Uh, I'll start with Councillor Ette. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Hello. Hello. Councillor Haneke. I'm present. Councillor Taub. Present. And Councillor DeAngelis. Present. And Pre Councillor Rooney is also present. So we are all here and accounted for. Thank you. Thank you for the reminder. Uh, again, so we uh, public comment, public comments on matters strictly within the jurisdiction of the CRC. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes at the, at the discretion of the CRC chair based on the number of people who want to speak. We will not engage in a dialogue or comment on a matter that's raised during public comment. Are there folks in the audience who would like to um, make a public comment? I see Tom Crossman has his name up. Would you like to bring him in? Hi, Tom. Hi, good evening, everyone. Hope you're doing awesome. Um, just uh, looking back over previous meetings, and I noticed that um, one of the meetings has not been posted, uh, the meeting from January 30th. So I'm wondering um, if, there's, if that's going to be posted. Um, I just, uh, you know, I want to go back and take some notes from some of the dialogue that took place uh, uh, from the landlord's perspective, as well as the uh, CRC's perspective. Um, I did take notes on the meeting, but um, being able to review the video would be uh, uh, helpful. Um, so that's, uh, that's it for now. Just wanted to check in about that meeting because it has not been posted yet. I'm going to look to Dave. Dave, can you reply, respond to that, please? Sure. Thanks, Pam. And thanks, Tom. I did just check in within the last two hours with our IT director, Sean Hannon, and he assured me that that meeting would be up, if not this evening, tomorrow morning. So it will be posted. I appreciate that. Again, just wanted to, uh, you know, make sure I have resources that I can go back to about the dialogue that has taken place between CRC and the landlords. That particular meeting um, was the one that had a little bit more content associated with landlords feedback on the matters of uh, things that the CRC are addressing and continuing to work on on a meeting by meeting basis. So I just wanted to uh, uh, make sure that we had access to that one as well. I appreciate all of your hard work and your time and commitment. And um, that's it for this evening. Thank you. We also do not have any any minutes from that meeting yet. So we're waiting for those as well. Um, uh, Renata Shepard has her hand up. Would you like to let her in, please? Hi, uh, Renata Shepard from Justice Drive. Um, I just want to say thank you for doing the work on the on the spreadsheet. I looked at that, and at least it makes things a little more clear in terms of what's being charged and you know the amounts being used. 
And I really, really hope you choose the lower end of the fees. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any other, anyone else from the audience interested in participating? Raise your hand, we'll let you know. We'll bring you in. I don't see any other hands, so I'm gonna move on to the next item, which is action items, uh, starting with VBA vacancies. So last meeting, we determined that the pool is sufficient for the current vacancies, which is one remainder, the remainder of one full position and the ongoing open associates slot. The question this time is, oh, and, and the bulletin board announcement was amended on the 14th of January. And so it is within roughly within two weeks of today. And the question is, is there um, sufficient pool for considering um, uh, openings beyond the current, the two current ones? Welcome any thoughts on that. And there's a listing in our in our SharePoint package, which is not for public consumption, uh, just the listing of those people who have submitted uh, activity forms. Jennifer. So from what I'm seeing, we did not receive any additional CAF since the last meeting. So we're at eight for six spots. Mm -hmm. Okay, just wanted to confirm that. And we can continue, if we declare it su sufficient, we can, of course, still continue to receive CAFs. I believe so. I'm seeing Mandy nod her head. <laughs> any, any comments about sufficiency of pool? Mandy. I mean, as always, I'd love to see at least double the number of openings. Um, we don't have that. Um, but I also like to work efficiently as a committee, and I'm not sure we're going to get many more if we wait longer. Um, it's been open since November. The new vacancies are not necessarily different than the ones that were already posted in November that we've strived hard to get this many for. Um, and so, you know, I, again, as I think I said last meeting, I would lean towards, in, in some sense, resignedly saying the pool is sufficient so we can move forward and get these filled and be done with an important part of, you know, press forward and get it done, an important part of what this committee needs to do. Thank you. Yeah. Jennifer. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, we've put notices in our newsletter, I think twice. I think we've all been doing a lot of outreach, which we can continue to do. But I guess I'm saying it's maybe, I mean, there's always more we could do, but I think we, we have more applicants than vacancies and we can keep receiving cabs for another you know, until the interviews. So I think we, we do have to move on. I agree with Mandy Joe. Would anyone like to make a motion to that effect? Um, so I move that we declare the pool of applicants um, sufficient to go forward to the next step. I'll second. Thank you. Jennifer, you you muted yourself before you finished your sentence. I was just to say, I don't need to go any further. That's the motion. <laughs> Thank you. Any conversation? Any discussion on this? Pat, looking at you. Any other thoughts on that? So I'll start with the vote then. Um, Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Aye. Uh, Mandy Johanneke. Aye. 
Jennifer Tao. Yes. Aunt Rooney, yeah. Councilor Ette. Aye. Okay, it's unanimous. We believe we have a sufficient pool to take the next step, which is a nice segue into the next step. And that is um, Jennifer has nicely volunteered to pull um, us and the applicants for availability for interviews. And um, I think it might it might be helpful, at least I would find it helpful to give uh, her some parameters on what days are best for you all uh, before we try to reach out and, and include eight other people who may be uh, all the applicant pool. Jennifer. Uh, yeah, no, I'm actually opening my calendar. I just want to, so we'd be talking about not before the week of March 18th. Uh, let's see, Mandy, there's a two, we, we would have to post, um, remind, remind me the process here. So the interview meeting needs posted a minimum of a week in advance with the names of the applicants that will be interviewed and the statements of interest posted at the same time. Um, the statements of interest obviously need submitted to whoever's reviewing them for compliance with the policy and then gathering all of the packet for the posting in enough time for that person to be able to gather it all and get it to Athena for posting. I generally leave two days, um, sometimes three between when the interview, so about 10 days before the meeting is the interviews are is when I tend to have in the past had the statements of interest due. And then at that point, if you're counting back, it's how long you want to offer the applicants the ability to write their statements of interest. Um, normally, I try to give them at least a week. Yeah. So if it if it was, we're all looking at our calendars here. If it was any time during the week, starting the week of 18th, we would want to have statement of interest in our hands by looks like about the. Six or seven. Yeah. Yeah. Which means you'd have to have the interviews already set and the the deadline out to them. Although you don't have to have the interviews set when you do that if you know the earliest they can be, but you'd have to be communicating with the applicants this week to give them enough time for that deadline in terms of what that works that statements of interest need submitted. And then I would poll committee members to see when you're available to, for the interviews. And applicants. Do you do the committee members first or you do it all together? Um, I do it all together as part. Okay. I, I, I believe I sent Pam a sort of a, a, I don't know, it was a duplicate of a past poll to create mm -hmm. a new one. Um, and I just, it, it's a, it's an I, I do have the form. I do have that, that, that form. Yeah. Oh, so I just I didn't know if you did. That. So I can do us all together, the applicants yeah. and us. Okay. Yeah, I send that out to everyone. Okay. So it looks like we would we would want the uh, interviews no sooner than three sixteen to allow uh, essentially a week of communication um, to get a poll, get an interview date, and and to ask people to submit their statements of interest. And we have to recognize if someone does not submit a statement of interest, then they are not eligible to be included in the interview or for consideration. And that may, some people may drop out of that. Jennifer. So should, in the Google calendar, should I do the weeks of the 18th and the 25th? Or do you really, or do we want to get them all done the week of the 18th? May not be possible. Right. So I'll do both. So you will get a calendar. Yeah, you will get that for the uh, last two weeks in March. Okay. Thank you. Uh, again, I'm looking at Mandy. You can't tell, but I am looking at you. Um, that were there were there um, unusual opportunities that you tried to add into the mix so that you know sort of off off meeting typical meeting hours 
you tried to include? So I always try to include, um, in some sense, a mix of hours and days. Um, always, in, I think I always included various start times within our regular meetings themselves. So like the beginning of the meeting or midway through a regular meeting. Um, I always tried to, uh, the committee we had last time was much more flexible on date, on times to meet, I believe, than this committee is in terms of availability. So I always tried to include some early mornings, some midday around lunch hours, um, and then some afternoons and evenings, but um, that that might not be useful if we already know this committee doesn't have availability at all of those various times. The last CRC did um, in general. So it might be good to get an idea of availability of committee members so that the form, the form can get very unwieldy depending on how many times you include. Um, are there are there times that that might be, um, and I'm I'm gonna say for myself, there are often um, like Wednesday mornings or Friday mornings that aren't typically meetings that might be available for me. Is there anyone else who has some, you know, to give a range, maybe some morning morning hours as well, just to give Jennifer a, a target. Or lunch hours are people potentially free in and around a lunch hour. Um, I am. I have some flexibility. Maybe it's easier to ask who, you know, um, doesn't have flexibility. You know, because of you know, if you're teaching, you know, when you're you know, teaching a class or there's things. Can't this be done um, by yeah. email so that we don't? Well, no, Mandy was just suggesting we do it now, but I will just then do the Google poll. Well, not the poll, but what this is. If anyone, if anyone would like to share with her some opportunities for sort of off, off, traditional timeframes, please email Jennifer directly. That would be part of that. Or I okay. can stick to the times that we times and days that we usually meet. Okay. So I think we've I think we've wrapped that up. I think that's um, so we'll look for a poll and we'll um, I'll work with you as we reach out to people to ask for a statement of interest. That'll be our next. Okay. So let's move on to uh, the next action item. That is the nuisance bylaw. And I want to appreciate that acting cap act, acting chief Ting is with us as someone who has had some input on this bylaw and hopefully will continue to um, provide insight. Jennifer, um, Mandy, would you mind bringing that nuisance bylaw up? So just as an overview, since we have not talked about the nuisance bylaw in quite a long time, in fact, since, I don't know, last December or so, um, this is not that different from today's nuisance house bylaw, but it spells out in a little more detail some of the definitions, and it also approaches this as a nuisance that is um, not necessarily limited to partying and underage drinking, which was really the focus of the, the previous nuisance house. That said, are there any comments that people have about the, the few changes or um, that have been made? And if they are still appropriate or applicable, we could vote to accept them. Um, I don't really think I need to go through this chunk by chunk unless someone has a specific uh, 
item that they want to address. Pat, I'm sorry, I didn't see your hand. <laughs> That's okay. I, I still, I <laughs> see that there was a change made. Uh, I muted myself, I'm sorry. Uh, I see there was a change made to the in, indoor furniture being outside. Uh, and now it says upholstered furniture on the front lawn. Uh, there's no reason why somebody can't have an upholstered chair. A lot of garden chairs, etc., are upholstered. And you can put a, a, I don't think I would, but I might put an upholstered chair on my lawn and then bring it in. The issue is that there's a health code violation if it's left out and gets rained on and stuff like that. So I'm not sure where we have general bylaws relating to, I, it feels like, why isn't that just there? Um, so I'm not going to vote against this for this, but I feel like this is one of those oversteps that is a taste thing, uh, not a real nuisance issue. Because the nuisance issue would be taken care of by the uh, health code. Mm -hmm. Oh, Mandy. Yeah, I it, in thinking about this part a little longer, it there's such a difference in what upholstered means, um, including I think we talked about this last time. Um, outdoor fabrics are still technically upholstered furniture, um, and you know as as Pat indicated or Councillor DeAngelis indicated. Um, if there's a health code violation and it's much more of a health issue, and I know this one is that this bylaw is trying to get at things that, you know, as the purpose says, sort of create, um, you know, protect, it, it's trying to protect the quiet enjoyment of residents um, and all. And so I'm just having more and more of a problem, including the upholstered furniture on the front lawn as a property as something that makes a property a nuisance um because what's the difference between upholstered furniture that's indoor upholstered furniture and upholstered furniture that's outdoor upholstered furniture and non-upholstered furniture that's outdoor or indoor right uh, it could all still be ugly or it could all be very tasteful um and so i think in some sense this this number c3 here I would probably prefer to have it deleted completely at this point in time from this before we recommend an action to the council. Um, and I have some other comments later on, but I'll, we can stick with this one until we're done with it. I'm gonna weigh in and I think I would, as much as the sight of all of this really starts to annoy people, and uh, I know it personally annoys me when I see it, I would have to agree that it's it's a tough one to it, no one ever gets pulled aside because they've left furniture. You know, it, it just doesn't happen. There are so many more important things in life than than mm -hmm. the front lawn. As as much as I dislike it, I would probably I would probably agree with striking it. Anyone else? Anyone else weighing in on this? Want to? It seems like there's no mechanism for enforcement anyway, so it shouldn't. It's just all know what it's getting at. <laughs> that, that there are maybe other issues in the place. It doesn't really. It's not indicative of issues by itself, but it's sort of, <clears throat> okay, good, let's move on. <clears throat> uh, if we could go to F4, I think that was the next change. And it, this has already been highlighted, the loss of a permit designation of the property as a nuisance property may result in the suspension of revocation or denial of a permit under the bylaw, if the bylaw is applicable to the property. And I think this was, it says we need to cross-reference and the cross-reference is in the bylaw itself 
which is G3C. And there it says, can't get a permit if your property is, is under suspension or revocation. And here it says may. Jennifer, I mean, uh, uh, Mandy. So, so I'll explain that, but I actually am in thinking about this part of it. This is the part I wanted to discuss. Um, I think I would favor deleting this section um, and this potential enforcement. Um, but no, the cross-reference means the rental property bylaw would need to add as a reason to suspend or revoke or deny a permit, a designation as a nuisance property. That That's what that cross-reference is there because the, the rental permitting bylaw does not have that as a reason to be able to suspend a permit or deny a permit yet and that that's what that note means it would need to be added into that bylaw not this one it would need to stay in here but it would need to be added to that one for it to be possible but the longer i think about this i take to heart a lot of commenters that have said the penalty for violation of a bylaw should really be geared toward the person or persons who are violating the bylaw. And many of the acts that could violate this bylaw and cause a nuisance really relate to the people who are living there, which may or may not be the owners of the property. And if it's tenants that are living there, it may not be the owners of the property that are, are responsible for the behavior. And this bylaw has already created a way through the third infractions of bringing the owners of the property in to talk to the town and try and work out the situation between the owners and tenants and what's going on to rectify what's causing the property to be a nuisance. Um, and I think that's a positive and the rental registration bylaw has already incorporated into its regulations, I believe, and we can check later this meeting that if a property has been designated a nuisance property, um, the inspections can occur more frequently for that reason in order to get your rental permit. And I think those two together are the most appropriate actions for nuisance properties, but suspending or revoking a rental permit seems too harsh to me. So I, after thinking a lot, would like to delete section F4 completely, and then it would require some deletions of some other references down later in um section G and if there's an H and H, but um, I think my preference is to remove this as a potential penalty for having a property that is a nuisance property. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer. Well, not surprisingly, um, I, I think it should be there in 10 years of having, it's probably more because we've been doing this for two years. So in 10 to 12 years of having this uh, residential rental permit by law, residential rental property by law, there has never been a revocation or suspension or denial of a per rental permit. So it would, but I, so it has never happened and it may never happen. It's not something that town clearly just, you know, does willy nilly, but I think that, that it's, that should be there if, um, you know, there's, if, and I, if you have a nuisance property, I mean, if, if there's, you know, if, if there's a call coming once every two weeks, I don't think that happens. I mean, I think there's some some circumstances where um, a property owner does um, lose their right to continue to rent, at least for some period of time. And again, it's will probably never happen, but I don't, I think that I mean, you know, you can have your driver's license suspended. There's any kind of a permit or license. There's that is the ultimate penalty down the line. And I that so that it's the occupant and maybe not the 
property owner who's violating the bylaw, I think we're trying to get the message across that the property owner does have some responsibility. Um, I know that I've seen in my own neighborhood that there are houses that have been nuisance properties for a number of years, and then there'll be a new property owner, a new management company, and they will, the house stops being a nuisance house because they lay down certain rules, whether it's more careful, diligent screening of the tenants, or it's, you know, like one house around the corner that was a nuisance house for the last two years, this year, as part of the lease, the eight students that live in the two units were, there's a limit to the number of guests that they can have. That's that's part of the lease and the house went from being a nuisance property to not being. So I think that this is, you know, if it gets the message across that the property owner, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. Um, I think that that's one of the reasons that we are looking at this bylaw in the first place and looking to strengthen it. Pat. Uh, we'll go with uh, Chief Ting first. Okay, right, thank you, Chief Ting. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, so one question in regards to this is, um, if you have a landlord or a property owner that owns several properties, and let's say they own five properties, but they only have one property in question, that's a problem. So if their um, rental permit is suspended, is it suspended for every property or just that one property? And I guess that's question number one. And question number two would be, if it was a um, rental property company that's managing it, you know, how does that, how does that play out? You know, does it, is the onus still on the owner of the property or is the management company now um, being held responsible? So a couple of questions to, to throw out there. I'm going to answer one if I can, and that is that if it is, if it, it doesn't actually matter how many properties that person owns, uh, it is the one in question where the, where the nuisances have occurred. So that's, it should not, it should not engage them all. Um, Pat, why don't we go back to you? Thank you. Uh, the major flaw in your argument, Jennifer, goes to the driver's license. Yes, I can lose my driver's license, but it's because of an action of mine, not because of an action of my passenger or the owner of the car, if I'm not the owner of the car. So I agree with Mandy that this is uh, not, that this should be removed. Councillor Ette. I'm wondering about the fundamental reasoning for keeping or not keeping it. I um, am ambivalent about four, but I'm in, interested in having something in a bylaw that is consistently not enforced. Is it ineffective because it's not, not enforced or by keeping it in, does that prevent people from acting in a way that would actually make it enforced if they go over? So I'm not really sure about that. And that actually applies as well to the upholstered chair. Should we keep that in, even if it's not going to be enforced or by, or should we take that out? Because again, it's not enforced. Can you, sorry, can you, can you repeat that? I think I understood that the, your question is, um, is having this in here, is it effective if it is not enforced? But what was the what was the alternate, the opposite of that? Okay. So it, it could serve as a, a warning of what could happen. And because it's in place, there's a possibility that we won't have some nuisance spots. So even if it's not enforced, it doesn't mean it's not effective. But then if we have something that isn't being enforced, there are others who would look at it and say that it is ineffective because for 10 years, 20 years, it's been on the books, but nothing has been done about it. I, I, 
I tend to lean to having it removed if for this long it hasn't been enforced at all. But I'm wondering about um, the logic one way or the other. Thank you. Thank you. And I might look at Chief Ting again for this, the discussion of, of enforcement. Um, So, you know, in terms of um, our existing nuisance uh, town bylaw, you know, I would say that we average probably about 20 to 25 annually um, citations that we issue. And usually it's a secondary offense. We rarely use it as a primary offense. Uh, usually it's a noise complaint um, and we find underage drinkers there or they're particularly uh, rambunctious or whatnot. So we might add that uh, that layer of enforcement. Um, however, I think what you're talking about is discretion, right? Uh, and that's something that we really take into consideration in terms of being reasonable, uh, given whatever circumstance that brought us there. Uh, the one good thing that I can say about the nuisance bylaw in terms of the violations that we've issued, the recidivism rate is really low. So usually when we issue that citation, we rarely see repeat offenders. What I do like about the expansion of this bylaw is uh, is something that you you're kind of talking about the potential. You know, uh, if if we do find a property owner or a specific property with tenants that that are there in violation with really egregious offenses, this kind of gives us a tool to potentially use. But of course, anytime we are affecting any type of violation, you know we we have to rationalize and justify our actions. So um, we're not just handing them out willy nilly, you know, we're really, anytime we are issuing these citations, it's for a solid reason and, and we can back it up uh, because there is an appeal process. And when the folks do appeal it, you know, rarely do they win because we, we have really good cause for issuing those citations. I hope that's helpful. Jennifer, then Mandy. Um, yeah, I think the reason, my point in saying that they have never revoked or suspended or denied a permit um, over the last 10 to 12 years is, as Chief uh, Ting said, that is not, that would only happen in a very egregious situation. Um, so it's something that a lot of restraint is used on the town's part, but I think having it there is does I don't is putting the you know making it clear that that can happen. I would think, and to answer the chief's question about who would be responsible, the property management company or the homeowner or the property owner, I still think it would be the property owner. I mean, if I go away for two years and I rent out my house, even if I have a management company, and it's a the tenants in my house are, are are just causing a disturbance to the inability of my neighbors to have the peaceful enjoyment of their home. I don't think I can say from, you know, where I'm on sabbatical for, you know, wherever I am, well, it's not me. You just, you know, that that's, you know, kind of what you have to live with. Um, I think that I would be responsible if there was, you know, if there were three or four you know, I think we have four, three times that there's it's a, a nuisance call is made. But I think if it's a perpetual problem and I have to say in my neighborhood, there have been houses and most of them have been corrected over time. But there have been houses where calls are made, you know, repeatedly throughout a year over a period of years. It may I mean, it may be on. I'm not saying this as a joke. It may be all 20 of those houses are in my neighborhood that you're going at, you know, but um, in certain areas, you know, certain streets, certain neighborhoods, there, um, you know, and again, this house I'm thinking of on Sunset, where there it was a nuisance house for two years, and the property owner really, maybe it was through the management company, just you know, said we are going to try and change what's going on here, and they did. So, and I think you know, some of these the nuisance bylaws. Um, you know, we're part of the incentive for that happening. Um, let me go to uh, Mandy Joe and just add 
if you have another question, then we go back to Chief Ting. And I don't have a question. So if Chief Ting wants to answer before I comment Great. again. Uh, yeah, I just want to throw this out there. Um, and and I definitely I hear what your what Councillor Taub is saying. Um, but just a couple of variables to throw in there. You know, a lot of times, uh, you know, the 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 rental tenancy changes hands, and sometimes semester by semester. So that's something that just we just need to take into consideration. You know, a lot of times with um, with landlords, sometimes they luck out. You never know what you're going to get. A lot of times, you know. When you're renting it out, especially to undergrad students, they're going to put on a good face and tell you all the things you want to hear. And then once they're in the house, um, it just turns into uh, a problem. Um, so I see that all the time. And sometimes you get great tenants, sometimes you don't. So I'm just saying, you know, uh, perhaps that's something to be taken into consideration that uh, you're going to have different tenants, you know, from one semester to another or one year to another. I think I'd like to weigh in since I haven't spoken on it. Part of part of me wants to um, to have a statement in the book that says if things really get out of hand, the town has the ability to say no to a permit. We understand that there are appeal processes. We understand that um, there are you know, essentially three strikes before something really gets to this point ever. Um, we're not talking in this F number F4, we're not talking about an emergency situation where a house has to be uh, evacuated. That's, that's a different scenario. Um, part of, part of what Part of what gives me a little comfort that we have this as almost like a backbone is that if it's just the frequency of inspection um, or or the application of fines given you know associated with citations, that's I mean that's exactly what we have today. Is 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 it any different going forward if we remove this sentence? I think. Uh, at the beginning of this process, we talked about a point system that some towns uh, use where if you reach X number of points in a in a year that your your um, your permit is up for con for discussion. Uh, and it feels like this is probably the one phrase that we have maintained of that nature. I think we we've, we've sort of gotten rid of some of the excess stuff. This one doesn't say you will. It doesn't say will. It just says may result. It's it's within consideration and at discretion. Um, I don't think the town wants to be heavy handed. I I almost would say this may never be used. But for a new landlord, a new owner coming into town and establishing themselves as a new manager or or owner, I think it's I think it's important for them to be warned that their their attitude and their approach to their tenants can make a big difference, and it and it behooves them to to um, do the right thing in sort of training and educating their tenants. If if all gets out of hand, um, I personally feel like this one phrase um, might come into play at some point. So, uh, um, Mandy Jo. A couple of things um, in response to both um, some of the comments that were made. There are two big differences in this nuisance property draft bylaw than the current nuisance house bylaw. And I think both make a big difference. The first is, as Pam started the meeting with, or this section with, is we're expanding it to apply not just to possession of under underage alcohol violations and large parties. 
we're saying there's a lot more that's involved in a nuisance house and causing a nuisance property. Um, and so, and, and many of those disorderly conduct, public urination, public fights, um, litter on the front lawn, blocking of public ways due to gatherings, um, you know, even refuse collection in a sense, but obstruction of public ways, you know, some of those general bylaw ones, unlawful noise in particular, are the sole responsibility of the tenant or maybe even the tenant's guests. If there's a tenant, the person living there, that might be an owner because we cannot forget that this applies to every property, no matter whether it's a rental property or a non-rental property. Yet we always come back to those rental properties. The second big difference is down here in corrective action the correction process that we have here that literally brings in the owner of the property, whether that owner lives at the property or not, after the third violation, to talk to the town and say, what are you going to do? That does not exist in our current bylaw. And I think that Jennifer is what you were going to of how do we get the, if, if it is a rental property, how do we get the landlords involved? This correction process is how we get them to care. That's the very important part of this rewrite of the nuisance property bylaw is the correction process that requires a corrective action plan to be filed by the property owner. That property owner might live in the property and have to file it, or that property owner might have to talk to tenants if they don't live in the property. That is huge. But there is exactly one enforcement and penalty that only applies to a subset of property owners in this bylaw. The monetary penalty will apply to property owners equally starting at the third or greater infraction. Um, I think it's the third one up here. A uh, third or greater infraction, it's not just the occupants, it's the owner. Abatement, all reasonable means would apply to an owner if it's up applicable to an owner equally. Response costs equally, no matter whether the owner lives at the property or not, depending on who the town goes after. Um, but loss of rental permit would only ever apply to a subset of property owners. And I think that's the other thing that sits wrong with me is that we're writing into a bylaw something that doesn't apply equally to all members of the status of property owner in this town. And that doesn't sit right with me, as well as the fact that it's the correction process that gets them to listen. Maybe someone believes it's the potential loss of a rental permit, but here we go. You can have a nuisance property with an owner that lives there and you can't kick them out. You can't, no matter if they have that nuisance property designated for a year and a half or two years, they still get to live in their property and just keep paying the fines. But you're gonna say, oh, hey, owner, because you don't actually live there and you rent it to tenants, we're gonna pull your permit and you can't have someone live in it other than maybe yourself, but you might not, you might have a different house you're living in. That seems wrong to me. The correction process is there for a reason. The correction process is what we should see if it works because that's the new thing. So I, you know, I, I cannot support this rewrite anymore if it's got the loss of rental permit in it. Thank you, good points, Jennifer. Um, yeah, I don't, I mean, that's, this is, you are different if you're renting it out. It's like having a business license. Yeah. If you own the pro, you could move into the property if you wanted to, but if the correction process doesn't work, I mean, this isn't, you know, what I'm going to die on, but I think that the logic is very, doesn't hang together for me. This, it is a privilege to be able to have a rental permit and rent property in town. And if you are not, um, meeting, you know, if you are negligent according to our rules, then you, you know, may 
be suspended for six months or some period of time, or in some cases not be able to renew or get a permit. But I don't, it's, it's not, a, it is a different, you know, you're talking about different people. You're, you're, so again, I'm not being articulate, but there was, this is clearly by its, the fact that it says rental permit, only speaking to people who have it using their, who are operating a business through their property. Um, and they're, so I would say two things. I mean, they're having the correction plan. You hope that it will work. It doesn't always work. And I know, you know, when I've done research in other college towns, State College, Pennsylvania, they regularly, you know, suspend or don't allow permits to be renewed if um, a property owner has a nuisance property over a certain period of time. I would like, I mean, if it is more palatable, I don't know that it would be to property owners to to know that there's, you know, they would never have any possibility of losing their permit to conduct rental business. But I would also just want the message to be out there that I have seen it because I live, you know, represent the district where a lot of these 20 properties are and that property owners can't houses. I have seen them go from being nuisance houses over a period of years to not because the property owner or landlord has taken a different care in the parameters they set, the rules they set, and how they um, set, you know, how the wording and what they require in the leases and the interview process for selecting tenants. So um, there, there is the property owner really can have, um, can impact whether a property is a nuisance house that is real is changing the way the people around the neighbors are able, you know, to it to live peacefully in their homes. Thank you. I, uh, I appreciate the the points that that Mandy did bring up about the correction process. Um, in in my mind, this number four wouldn't apply to an owner occupant just living in his or her own place, it would be, um, it, it only applies to rentals, but rentals is in fact a subset of the category of housing uh, and operation in the town. Um, but it doesn't mean that everything else doesn't apply to um, an owner occupant. So in, in my mind, it wasn't being discriminatory. It was simply saying, if you're a rental, this might apply to you. If you're not a rental, it doesn't apply to you at all, but the other the other elements do. Pat. Yeah, I just want to uh, check with Chief, okay. Chief Ting because initially Jennifer said, I don't think all 20 properties are in my neighborhood, but it feels like that, I thought you said, but you just got done. I said maybe all 20 are in my neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, and then this last time you said they were in your neighborhood, so... I would like Chief Ting to confirm that one way or the other. <laughs> no, that that would re require some research. So <laughs> I couldn't. Are give they you the all answer. on uh, Lincoln Avenue, Amity Street, all there, all twenty? No, I don't think so. I think there's no. <laughs> I I might say District Four may have a lot disproportionate. Yeah, if you don't live in other neighborhoods, you should check out some of ours. So this is this is a um, sort of a watershed right here. I mean, it is it is definitely a point of consideration. Um, is is I'm 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 trying to ask what is the harm of having this statement if it is never enforced or uh, if if something doesn't come to this point. Does having it in the bylaw reflect um, an intention and a and a word to the wise to anyone anyone in town? Uh, Mandy Joe. So we can't say it would never be enforced because this is brand new. This part, you know, the current there is no current bylaw that says being a nuisance house or a nuisance property may result in the revocation of a rental 
residential rental permit. That doesn't exist in our town right now. So there's no way we can say no one would enforce it. Um, and to just say, oh, leave it in because it's not going to be enforced. Well, to, to answer Councillor Hete's rule, I am not a fan of writing a law that you don't intend to enforce. That seems, you know, we have, as a council over the last five years have tried to get rid of laws we're not enforcing, not write new laws that we say won't be enforced. <laughs> like, it, it makes no sense to me to put something in there that you just say, but we don't want to enforce it. And we not don't intend to enforce it. Um, so to me, it makes a lot of difference. Um, if if it's in here or not. If it's in here to me, it says, yeah, this is a real possibility and, and it might happen. And if it's not in here, it says, no, it's not gonna happen. But if it's in here, there's no way you can say, ah, it's in here, but it's not gonna happen. I, I think that would be disingenuous to even make that statement. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, well, if it's in here, it should be able to happen. The point is just that we are, a you know our we are a responsible town and we would understand that if a permit was ever to be revoked or or not allowed to be renewed that would be an extraordinary circumstance but i think if it's there it should be because it could happen um we in our current bylaw you can have a permit suspended or revoked i mean the reason it has never happened isn't because it's not permitted I didn't say you couldn't suspend or revoke a permit. I said you cannot do it for being or a nuisance. Or for a nuisance. Property. For being a nuisance. Okay. But I I I think if it if it stays here, it I would I would say it's not there just to be empty words, but it is something that could happen in an egregious case. We seem to be at a we, we do seem to be at a watershed here, um, uh, Mandy Joe. Well, I I will just make a motion to delete section F four. Second. Uh, okay, well, let's take a vote then. Any well, any other discussion before we take a vote? Any other comments? I would I would like to ask, maybe I'd like to go back to Chief Ting one more time and, and ask about um, the enforcement. I understand that it is it is a there's a low probability of something happening, but the fact that we say this could be the consequence. I mean, we learned to grow up with understanding what the consequences of our actions are. This is a consequence of, um, a, in a sense, a poorly managed property, which I think if we have everything else in place, there should be a corrective process. It should not, not ever have to come to this. Um, and I understand that the landlords are particularly concerned that um, actions of their tenants should should reflect on the tenants themselves and the tenants are responsible responsible for their actions. Um, all that said, there are a number of things in this bylaw as as Manny Joe pointed out that are not necessarily all tenant actions mm -hmm. and and so um, I appreciate being able to keep this one phrase in. Councilor Ette, you had your hand up? I thought better of it. Thank you. So we'll go to a vote. Um, let's see. I'll just go from, in my viewing screen, I'll go from top to bottom. Councilor Ette, we're voting, excuse me, we're voting to remove uh, line item four. Aye. Pam Rooney is a no. Councillor Haneke? Aye. Senator Taub? No. Pat DeAngelis? Aye. Um, so it's an aye. Ayes pass.
And I think that was the only other item that had uh, any potential changes. Is that correct? Uh, Mandy Jo. Um, with with the deletion of that, I believe G two B needs deleted. There were a couple of references to that possibility. Mm, thank you. I'll see if there were any others. I know there was there was that one, but there might be another one. I'll see. Um, C three C. Councilor Ette, while well, she's looking for that. I was wondering what we had decided with the upholstered chairs. We took it out. Okay. Or I heard I heard no one saying, no, please leave it in. So in my mind, uh, I'll I'll just comment on this. In my mind, it feels like we have we have watered down this particular bylaw, even though we've added a whole slew of references to other other bylaws and other forms of management. Um, but it does feel like we have taken the teeth out of the fact that nuisance properties, which are annoying, egregious sometimes, somehow doesn't have um, the weight of closure to force an owner to sit up and notice. I, I, and I understand that we have a corrective plan, et cetera, but I, I suspect given how long it takes sometimes to uh, work through that system that we may at the end of the semester and the, the tenants may change and we don't have anything to show for it except perhaps the frustration of the manager or the landlord because they had to go through the process which in itself might be forced them to correct their actions the following year and be a little more stern with their tenants to begin with um i think we've I think we've made our way through this. I just expressed my feelings about that part of it. Um, would anyone rec uh, like to make a motion about moving this forward? Mandy. That's what I raised my hand to do. <laughs> so yeah. I move to recommend the town council um, rescind the current bylaw, general bylaw 3.26 nuisance house and replace it with Proposed bylaw 3.26 nuisance property as amended at this meeting. Right. And you'll and we can change the revision number and the date on that. It'll get and changed when I hit save, but I didn't feel like doing that on shared screen. Uh, any any second? Second. Thank you. Um all those in favor, I'll start at the top of my screen. Uh, Mandy Jo. Aye. Pam Rooney. Aye. Councilor Ette. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. It is unanimous. We have we have moved nuisance bylaw to the next step, which is to take it back to Town Council for consideration and a vote. Uh, quick um, question. Uh, yeah, I have a question about that. We should go back to the referral. I think it would actually go directly to GOL okay. for clear consistency and actionability. Uh, do you mind checking on that and and taking the correct action? I'm I'm happy to otherwise, but. So the passage over should always come from the chair of the body. All right. 
I will do that then. Thank you. And that's going to go back into our SharePoint packet, and you're going to save it as today's date. Great. Yeah. Thank you. I will send a clean copy to GOL for their review of whatever they review. The little three, the three liner that they do. Clarity, consistency, and actionability. Thanks for that one. Okay. And I will take care of that before the end of the week. I'm very excited. We got through one. Rob has joined us. Thank you, Chief Ting. I think that was your, I think that was your uh, bailiwick and you are more than welcome to say if you'd like, but you do not have to. As we go- You must be so happy we're done with this. <laughs> I think I'm good. I, I appreciate uh, being involved in this process. I really do. Thank you and have a good evening. Appreciate Thank you being here. Thank you. Take care. And Rob is also very appreciative to be back talking with us again. I can tell. <laughs> um, we are going to look first at fees. And I want to thank Mandy for a really, really nice job of organizing the, the variables um, that are based not only on the base fee, but also on the on any kind of fee for additional units and then the maximum number of, of units to which it applies. Um, her, her table, um, if you want to pull that up, was organized in a way that went from, I'll just say from, from maximum revenue to minimum revenue. Uh, it's like, that's, that's correct. Um, yeah. And and again, that was very, very helpful. Um, I'm happy to talk about this, but if anyone else wants to talk about it, you certainly can. So, Mandy. Yeah, I just wanted to explain a little bit more, including the coloring. So, um, yeah, I, I organized it so it's... Um, so, so A on this one, the top one is the one that would raise the most revenue from fees and use the least amount of strategic partnership agreement revenue to backstop to get up to the estimated um, program costs of the bylaw. Um, as you go farther down towards the bottom, um, the usage of the strategic partnership agreement revenue to to meet the estimated cost of the program increases. The last two would use more money for the more strategic partnership revenue than is actually available. But I was asked to include at least one of them on this chart. So I did not leave them out. Coloring wise, the green one is as, as marked the, the fee structure that was recommended um, in, previously. So that's where where what we recommended as sort of a baseline of where these other ones fall. Um, and the blue sort of coloring is the 10 unit option, basically, and the yellow sort of coloring is the 20 unit option. Um, so so that that's the other coloring if people hadn't figured it out. Thank you. Yeah. And again, it was it was relatively easy to make your way through this to understand what the different variables are. Um, anyone else want to comment on this before I weigh in? I don't see any hands. Okay, so I'm gonna weigh in. <clears throat> um, what I appreciated is that in fact, it, it does work at the bottom um, item K and I just added these, the alphabet so it's easier to refer to a line that we want to talk about line K and line J and actually line I do not do not meet our basic condition of, as Mandy just said, of trying to meet the projected cost of, of managing this program. If we if we're going to implement this, we would like it to at least minimally meet that rough cost, um, so that we do not place additional burden on the financing of the town. So, in in my mind, we could gray out 
the bottom three items. And if anyone else wants to discuss those further, um, you know, as, as having potential, please do. These are just my reactions to the numbers that I saw. When I looked at the, uh, what struck me is that letter E, which is the green one, um, is pretty much on target as, as we were asked to do, like, how would you structure this so that your, um, so that your costs are covered? So that one hits it pretty darn nicely. Um, it's, it's slightly over the projected program cost of $474,000. Um, I ran a couple of scenarios based on, you know, one fee, I mean, one unit, three units, maybe up to eight units to see which ones are most favorable for um, property owners in town. And um, I was looking pretty favorably at line H. And I'll just give you my my thinking on that. Line H, but one of my other considerations is that I would like to keep every single fee as low as it could be and still meet that bare minimum of, of cost for the program. So letter H, um, to me, with a revenue of roughly $454,000 on the far right-hand side um, was based on having about $68,000 coming from the special revenue, um, essentially UMass contributing toward the upkeep of the, the inspection of properties for the health and safety of their students. And it occurred to me that um, the number was a little that the 453,000 is a little lower than 474, but I would not be opposed to raising the amount from special, whatever that's called, the, the SPA, by another $20,000 and making the contribution from UMass be $68,000 to balance our number out. I liked this because um, the fee for a non-owner occupied uh, unit is one hundred and fifty one hundred and fifty dollars rather than two hundred or two fifty. I really don't want to see those fees at two fifty. So to me, the fee, um, the scale of the fees met our purposes, and basically meets our target using a little bit more money from UMass. So I'm going to stop talking. Um, Mandy. Um, so I, I have my own thoughts, but I wanted to clarify one more thing. This, the amount of estimated revenue in, in this column here, if added to this column here, the base revenue will equal 474 together. The amount in this column here, right here, is base revenue plus complaint. So, so this column here of estimated base revenue plus the complaint and ins reinspection potential fee revenue is what you get here. Um, we have had in previous meetings, uh, Rob Mora say that it is unlikely that this complaint and reinspection fee revenue will be collected, which is why we haven't really been using this column here as the total revenue. Um, what, what it means though is if some of the second to last column is collected, complaint and reinspection revenue is collected, it would reduce the amount of strategic partnership revenue needed to be used to get to 474. So so if you actually collected the 453 from column H over here because of a, a hugely 
guesstimate of how many complaints and reinspections there would be, and if it was all collected, then you would actually need only approximately 20,000 of the strategic partnership revenue because it would reduce the amount needed. All of it would reduce the amount needed by approximately $50,000 of, of this number here. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that. Um, I, had it, I had it completely wrong then. Yeah, it, it, it's okay. Uh, it, it's been confusing, but it's been based on, Rob asked us to, to really consider these numbers here and then this number here that puts the numbers in this column up to 474. What I wanted to say is when I looked at this set, I actually liked item D. Um, because it, uh, for a similar reason, it reduced the, the first unit application fee to 150. Um, kept the to the fees charged to 10 units with given our regulations of only 10 units will be inspected or so in a property that seems to at least align a little bit better than charging an application fee on up to 20 units, but then only regularly inspecting 10 units over the course of five years. Um, and then it charged, you know, some of these were half of the 150 for each additional unit. This one went pretty high, right? Um, 125 for each additional unit, which means the maximum is is actually somewhat less than the 1575 down here but still brings in enough revenue um in a, within a comfortable range is actually quite close to what what the finance committee and CRC previously said was a recommended number um up here this the the 68 still con concerns me because it's getting closer to the maximum of strategic partnership revenue if we have underestimated the estimated total base revenue. Um, so I would personally like to see us keep on the low side of potentially needing strategic partnership revenue. So I thought line D, given all of these options, was in some sense my preferred line. Jennifer. Uh, this is more of like an accounting question. <clears throat> so because we don't know, we, we not know till the end of the year, how much we're going to have to use of the strategic partnership funds. So does that mean they'll just stay kind of in an account and that they can't be then, we can't say for sure that we were only going to use like $49,149 so that the other 50,000 could be budgeted for another use. We would have to keep it there in case we need more of it because we didn't collect as much as we thought from the inspection. And so it's just a question. A question perhaps for Rob Morrow. Yes. So my understanding, and Dave might be able to add to this if I've got it wrong, is that the money from the strategic partnership uh, agreement from the first year that it's provided remains in the account and you know we'll be able to utilize it if we need to in future years um, i also understood today that there's only three additional years beyond the first year that we've received uh, that we can really rely on so just so you have that in mind that in the future we may have we don't know if we're going to have it in the future uh, and that may may need to be dealt with uh, by the town manager for financing the program going beyond three years from now. Uh, but those funds as needed would be available in the account for us to use at toward you know when we come to the end if we didn't do as many as inspections as anticipated or enough to uh, meet our base value that's how it would be uh, utilized. I have, I have a question while Rob is still. Still talking. Um, I just forgot my question, Mandy. I had a question too, so I'll ask mine. It actually popped up. I was curious if Rob had a thought on which of these options the inspection services department might prefer. Yes, I, you know I actually like G. Um, probably for many of the same reasons that everyone else has mentioned but differently in that I feel like more of the strategic partnership money should be put to this purpose 
to keep the fees down and, you know, to go towards its intended use. And I think that leaves enough. I mean, you know, going into this, knowing that we have one year of that strategic partnership money in the bank right now, and, you know, $30,000 approximately per year going forward, I think that's good. Um, I think most of this will become pretty predictable as soon as we build the program and, uh, you know, we'll be able to conduct the number of inspections that we need to, to complete the five-year cycle. So I, I, I'd rather see the fees lower. I remembered my question. And that is, um, why would we not be charging for complaint and reinspection fees? We may not do it today, but if we're really um, concerned about this program, why would we not? I, I think we will have some. I, I don't want us to rely on it. And I'm not sure in the first few years we would expect much. Um, you know, it's a big change to this program. And I think we need to spend, expect to spend a few years educating and working through the problems and not, you know, running around writing tickets everywhere. Um, you know, the other side of that is if we write tickets, there's a lot, a lot of work that follows up after that. Uh, you know, in a perfect world, the ticket gets paid, money comes in, we get it. Uh, if not, we go to court. You know, we have to see that process through. So it's not a not an approach with the program that I'd want to take from the day day one with it, but in the long term, uh, I think it absolutely will be utilized more than it has. I was going to um, add then, and and I may have been looking at this entire table slightly wrong, but I did do the math for the small, some small units. So the one and, and up to three units that we had originally talked about having um, at least some soft spot for. And so when I did the math for that, um, letter B came out as, as the most advantageous for the small number of units. It's, um, it's a slightly lower fee than today, and then the seventy-five dollar per unit um, max was um, kept kept cost within range a little bit to what what uh, Rob just said. Um, Rob, I'm sorry. Can you explain again why G felt good for you? Because when I did the math for that, it was that that fee structure is is pretty steep for the one, two, or three unit. Um, uh, property owners. Uh, so G is is the hundred dollars, hundred and fifty, and then one hundred to a max of ten fifty. Right? Am I looking at the right one? Yeah. I'm not sure why that worked out to be higher. Yeah, so G is 150 for non owner occupied G is 150 for the application fee for the first unit and if you have two units you'd be paying 250 for the application fee. If you have three units you'd be paying 350 in B right. your first unit you would pay 200 which is $50 more than G. Your second unit you your total cost would be 275 which is $25 more than G. Uh, your third unit would be 350, which is the same as G. And so it would, starting at four units to 10 units, it would be slightly lower. I, I don't know where the break even, where it would then, where it passes 1,050, but it would be at four units that B becomes less costly than G. So we have a proposal sort of on the table. We have G um, as a as a starting point. Uh, Mandy, you said you uh, you liked D. I I could uh, do G. Okay, I'm I'm actually comfortable with G. Now that I know the math is my math was wrong. <laughs> Anyone else want to weigh in on that? Jennifer. 
I'm good with G2. David. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on, on what Rob had said earlier. You know, I don't have much to add. We did talk with the, the town manager a little bit about the strategic partnership funding, but yeah, just wanted to to reiterate, you know, that we we do have the first year of that funding, you know, in hand. And to Jennifer's earlier question about, um, you know, will it, will that funding be, you know, lost in the general fund or whatever? No, it will be kept year by year in a separate account. It, any unused funds in that account, as Rob said, would roll over. So, you know, I, I think that's kind of where Rob is on G that you have year one, which in essence is for FY24, um, and this program will not get launched in this fiscal year. Um, and then, you know, in, in G, you have roughly, you know, $30,000. If, if, if all the numbers play out and all the inspections and whatnot pay, plays out, you have that, that cushion as well. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to reiterate um, kind of some of Rob's points. Any other comments from Councillor Ette or Pat? Uh, G seems fine. It's nice to trust the staff. Mm -hmm. They've done the math too. <laughs> Hopefully more accurately, but I still like the far, the, the far column though with the potential revenue. I mean, it, it still makes sense. Um, I'm looking for then, I, I hear no objection to G. We've talked about it. It seems to have merit. Uh, it's supported by staff. Is there anyone that would like to make a motion? The um, motion shouldn't be on the on that document. I'm working on modifying the document the motion would be on. And I'll put that up in a second. I was thinking more to, to vote the acceptance of this approach. And maybe we've already come to a consensus. It's 150, 100 max, 1050. Okay. You're actually modifying our schedule sheet. I'm just having problems finding it. Hold on. So I think this would be the fee schedule based on that that concept we just discussed. For principal residence, 100. For all other parcels, 150 plus 100 per unit over one unit up to a maximum of 1,050. That is the same as our sheet, yeah. And inspection fees of 150 and the rest of this. Yeah. Anyone want to make a motion? I'll make a motion to adopt the fee schedule as amended. Well, to to recommend the council adopt the fee schedule as amended. <laughs> Second, DeAngelis. All, let's see, not all those in favor. Uh, Jennifer, we'll start with you. Yes. <clears throat> Emma's next, yes. Councilor Ette. Aye. Councilor Haneke. Aye. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Unanimous that we support the fee structure um, as discussed and amended. Two, two down. 
We're getting there, Rob. So, um, we're going to talk, talk about regs and bylaw. We have not talked about the actual bylaw for a little bit. I would like to briefly talk about the regs for a couple minutes. What time is it? Oh, it's eight. Um, I don't think we have any other business. Really. Okay, let's keep going till just about quarter after. We're having so much fun, you know, just time flies. And if you could bring up that the 1214 version. Just um, regs or bylaw? Regs. So this needs to be changed, uh, modified based on the fee inspection or the fees and inspection that we just discussed. So that would go to the frequency inspection, frequency schedule. I'm not sure it does, but we'll look, where is that? Should be right up under B, B1, B1, two and three. So maybe these numbers don't change. Oh, I'm I, not did sure. a, I, I did have a note on this. If we could look at, at number item two, which is the bottom of page one. Well, yeah, right there. So it discusses general bylaw 3.26 nuisance house bylaw. If we could just call that nuisance bylaw, that way we don't have to come back to this if um, one way or the other. And then, thank you, I'll just delete that. Unless someone wants to keep it. Um, just above B um, in item number in item number two, so it would be A A two. Yeah, um, it talks about uh, response to a message left on the uh, by the town in case of emergency should be returned or responded to within one hour. Um, I'm I'm wanting to ask Rob if we. If it changed to two hours, two hours is the is the amount of time that Nantucket allows for emergency contact. Would two hours work? One just seems like it just an incredibly short period of time. Um, I don't have a problem with that. I mean, there are there are situations where you know responses you know, quicker response is really necessary, but I don't have a problem with that changing to two hours. Anyone else feel strongly? Um, where we got rid of nuisance house bylaw, could we just put in nuisance property since it looks like all of it's going to come at the same time? And then just sort of keep in our minds if nuisance doesn't pass, we need to modify it back because it probably should read the title and we've just modified it to nuisance property or a recommending. So can we just put the word property back in like that? Sure. Are there any other suggestions or changes that people saw in this document that they feel strongly need to be corrected or changed?
I don't see any hands. Shall I make a motion? Sure. I move to recommend the town council adopt the regulations for general bylaw 3.50 residential rental property as amended. Second. Second. <laughs> Uh, let's start. Um, any any comment before we st go for a vote? I'm going to start at the top with Councillor Ette. Aye. Yeah, Rooney is next. Aye for her. Councillor Haneke. Aye. Pat D'Angelo. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. So the regs are unanimous. Ten. Let me just double check. Hold on. Um, If we want to keep going, we could we could get make our way into the bylaw itself. I still have a couple minutes. So this document itself has gone through GOL for actionability, and there were a couple of changes. Um, and notes here from GOL. We, I think we've worked through these before to accept them. Yeah, and so these are actually from after the council sent this back to CRC for consideration after the first reading. So all the red lines in here are changes we made after the council referred this back to CRC. Just like all the changes in the other ones, the red lines were those two. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm gonna rely on folks having read this and gone through and made their own suggestions. Um, and if I don't see a hand, I'm just gonna start reading off the things that struck me. Um, and I'm gonna start with number, uh, it's on page two, number 19 under, under definitions. So we have short-term rental 31, or fewer consecutive days in um, in E4, it is described. There's also something that's very short term, um, and right there, which is less than 14 days. I'm I'm suggesting that maybe we for E4 we call it very short term rentals because the definition is right there. It says in the sentence rented less than 14 days, so as not to confuse with short term, which is the 31 consecutive days that's in item number 19. Thoughts, uh, Mandy? Yeah, um, we've been confused. Well, our, our attorney was was had, had a recommendation. And so, yeah, we should probably get rid of short term in front of residential rental property. So, so short-term residential rental for the definition that 19 is meant to distinguish an air a property that is rented in Airbnb style from something that is rented essentially long-term yearly things like that with a much longer lease. Um, so if you're you're renting it out a day or two at a time or two weeks at a time or whatever like that instead of years at a time. Um, the exemption is is here saying if you are that type of rental, a short term rental, but you don't do it uh, that 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 rental isn't occupied as a short term rental for more than fourteen days. You don't even have to apply for a permit. You know, so if you Airbnb your house for three weekends of a, a year, nine total days, you don't need a residential residential rental permit. But if you Airbnb your house for 20 
weekends a year, you do need a residential rental permit. Um, we just haven't figured out a good way to essentially say that. <laughs> um, 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 now I'm confused because I thought uh, an Airbnb has to register as a Airbnb and it is registered with the town no matter how many, no matter how many days they rent it out, and it then it wouldn't have to get a permit under this bylaw. I'm looking so at my under, Rob can probably answer this, but my understanding is the town does not have any requirements related to Airbnb rentals right now for permitting the rental. The town does tax that rental, um, and this rental property bylaw would require in order to get a permit would require them to have permits if they're renting it for more than 14 days in a year um, and would require them to prove that they've essentially are paying that tax in order to get the permit. But Rob might know more. The, the only thing different there is that uh, Airbnb now would permit with us through the current program. There, there isn't an exemption for that. So should we take um, line four right out? Or is this line four was for, you rent your house out for graduation and that's it? I think that was the intention. Yeah we, no, we, yeah, we have the, the, the short-term rental now, which is not Airbnb in our bylaw but an Airbnb does have to permit because there isn't any other exemption to that type of rental in the current bylaw or based on number of days or anything. So we have the 14 day exception for the short term rental, which is really supposed to be that kind of occasional temporary rental. Um, so I agree with what you said, Mandy, just that we do permit those now when mm. we're asked, do you need a permit? We do, uh, we do permit those when we know about them. So can we in this in this case can we just take out the term short term and just leave residential rental property rented less than 14 days and that makes sense? So we don't hung, get hung up on the Rob does that does that still make sense? Yeah, I think if it said, you know, property rented less than 14 days it, would cover that it would cover that situation um, my ne next example is going to um item g which is issuance and if if anyone has anything as we go through are there any other considerations of everything we've discussed that's in strike out and read. So issuance or denial, this is this comes back to our conversation about nuisance property. And we need to just double check that we aren't inappropriately linking this document to nuisance. If I go to item three, so G3, right here it says that um, application will be will be denied and a permit will not be issued. And I wondered because we have taken out the nuisance link that if it said application for property may be denied, any permit may not be issued. If does that make sense, Rob? Uh, not yet. Could, could you go over that again? Sure. Um, Mandy, can you highlight number three on this page? It's, it, it is hard to read. Yeah, right there. So right now it says, um, thank you. Uh, application, rental permit application will be denied and a permit will not be issued if property fails to comply, application is incomplete, 
or a residential permit for the property is currently subject to a suspension or revocation. Mandy. So the first one is, I think it should be suspension or revocation order, maybe, or is currently suspended or revoked, maybe. <laughs> I think maybe we lost a word in many of these versions. But I would say it needs to stay will because if the application is incomplete, I don't really want to give inspection services an option to perm issue a permit if they don't finish the application. I, I want the application denied and I want the bylaw to say, hey, if you don't complete the application, you're not getting a permit. Um, so I think the will is appropriate there for given these three options, unless there's an issue with a concern that if it's un currently suspended or revoked, that maybe it would get issued for the next year anyway. Um, I, I guess maybe Rob can weigh in on that one, but at least for A and B, I don't want it as a possibility that it'll be denied. I kind of want to say it, it's going to be denied. Rob? The, the only reason I'm still thinking about this is that somewhere in the language, and, I, and now I'm not sure if it's in the regulations, um, the requirement is that any town, local, state regulation shall be complied with. And then we're saying here that if the property fails to meet the requirement of this bylaw, which could be any of those regulations that we will, you know, not issue the permit. I just want to think about that a little bit more, um, how that connects with another section somewhere. So I'm, I'm looking at the clock and I'm thinking that that would be a really good thing to come back to um, if Rob does need some time to think about it. Um, I'd like to look at the very next item, which is for conditional permit. We had a short conversation. Oops, we went too far. Yeah, right there. Conditional permit and perhaps breaking this into two parts. A being the first being A, a residential property that does not pass the initial or renewal inspection. And then B being a residential permit. Um, that might be issued after inspection or reinspection. So there's sort of two categories of um, actually this is now mixing apples and oranges, I think. Um, so one is somebody's waiting for their schedule to come up. You know, it could be three years down the road before they're actually scheduled for an inspection. That's that's one conditional permit. So they keep getting a permit, even though they haven't been scheduled. The second one is a conditional permit, meaning there have been some violations. They're in the process of fixing them uh, or rolling into another year, and they get a conditional permit because there are some outstanding issues that are being worked on. So those, to me, are two two different categories. Mm -hmm. So A for A could be a residential property that has has not yet been or has been scheduled, but it has nothing to do with passing the initial the initial
Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Oh, and if this would be a B, sorry, it would be a B. Should there be a comma after above? I don't know. I mean, maybe. I don't know whether we do it anywhere else. Yeah, I guess it. Because it's like a clause after inspection. Which above? That one. This one? Yeah. This one. No, too. no, no, no. G, this one, G, G.2 above comma. I would, I think, I don't know. Oh, yeah. Okay. For both of them. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. So I'm going to ask Rob if this makes sense. We talked about this uh, a bit earlier. Yeah, um, and if you want, uh, the last section we talked about makes sense to leaving it alone uh, without having to change the, the, the will to a may. I think it can stay as will uh, as written. Thank you. Okay, it's it is twenty five after. <laughs> Are there? Um, yeah, I have I have a few more odds and ends. So the question is, do we want to stop right now, and um, and and come back to this one more time? Um, let's go I would love to push through personally. <laughs> it's just a few more. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Yes, no, up, up, thumbs up to push through. Oh, I'm not seeing a lot of action here. Let's push through. Let's see if we can do this. Um, I'd like to limit the push to nine o'clock. <laughs> oh, definitely. <laughs> Oh, definitely. I was thinking five minutes, but but. Oh, okay, that's good. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> uh, under K, under K, this is disclosure notification other requirements. Um, there's a confusing sentence under under A, and it says, uh, "Permit shall be conspicuously displayed." Da, 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 and shall be made available by the owner within 24 hours upon request by any person. And I'm thinking, no, I can't go to an owner and ask for that. So it should not be any person. I, I said by those listed officials or those listed above, in tenants, inspection officials, and emergency personnel. You could just say upon a request by those by those persons. So that's interesting because now that you mention it, why would the town need to ask the owner for it when the town could just look up the permit itself? So do we need the 24 hour request or should we just deal with conspicuous display? Could we just stop the sem sentence at emergency personnel easily accessible to and delete the rest? Hmm. Well, that would be a Rob question. Yeah, I agree that I don't think that last clause was for the officials getting it within 24 hours, that it may have been some other purpose if that was pulled from another bylaw, you know, if a uh, tenant, prospective tenant, or, you know, family member or something, you know, didn't see it posted and was asking the owner for it, the owner would have to produce it within 24 hours, but um, it'll be readily available through our, through our uh, electronic system anyway. So I'm not concerned if it's removed. Okay. Can we remove it? Great. Right. Okay. So immediately below that under B, 
Um, this is this is what a permit shows. A permit shows date of issuance, maximum number of persons, and then number three is maximum occupancy for the residential property. And I have no idea what that really means. If you have a if you have a residential permit plastered on the wall in a conspicuous space. Um, Number two is clear. You can only have four four people dwelling, you know, in this dwelling unit. But number three is maximum occupancy for the residential rental property. We just we talk about the property being could be could be twenty units, could you know, on a property. So I think we either strike number three, or you know, so let's say a large management company has a property with four hundred units. Why would that have to be listed on the permit? Because I think this is this is we're talking about it being displayed conspicuously. This is this is not the application itself. Any any comments on that? I think it makes sense to get rid of it personally. Thank you. Um, uh, number two, tenant information sheet. We were provided um, by actually Pat Caymans, I think, or somebody um, provided us a recent issuance by the state that talked about um, tenant rights. And so I wanted to suggest that after the word tenant information sheet, we might say, in addition to documents required by the state, the owner shall distribute to each tenant an information sheet as defined by the regulations. And I don't know if that's just redundant. Um, it's not It's not up to us to dictate to a, a manager or owner to, um, to distribute. It's, it's really the burden is on them. So we could just as easily not include that. I wanted to ask if that made sense. Rob? I think it's okay to be redundant here. Uh, we're actually handing that out and have been uh, for, since it became part of the later reg latest regulation. Uh, you know, sometimes we're handing it out to landlords or owners that have no idea what it is. And sometimes it's just to get it directly into the hands of the tenant. So um, I think it's okay to be redundant, but just so you know that it become it will become part of or referenced in our tenant information sheet. And whether it's incorporated somehow or an, an attachment to it, it'll be distributed whenever possible. Great. So we'll, we'll include that. And then I think one of my last items is, and I'm sorry, I did not mean to dominate this. I was hoping everybody else would come with their comments as well. Um, L consent, uh, item number two. And item number two talks about for all inspections, owner will make a good faith effort. This is a real sticking point uh, to arrange access by the authorized town personnel to any permit, blah, 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 within 24 hours of receiving a request. And I just felt that 24 hours of request for an inspection access is way too little. And I just said, how about five working days or five calendar days? Is Is that... Again, I'm looking at Rob. So I'll let Jennifer go first and then I make my comment. Sorry, I was looking at him. Oh, that no, that was I I had the same I I was really thinking would it be less onerous when completing an application for a permit to not have to commit to the 24 to an inspection within 24 hours. So yeah. I always I, I always understood L2 to mean that sort of what I just modified it to that that once the owner is contacted and says from by the town and says you know we need to arrange an inspection that the owner must contact the tenant within 24 hours to start making that good faith effort, not that the inspection must occur within those 24 hours. Um, this rewording might clear that up. I, I, I know it's been a sticking point with, with a number of commenters that getting access within 24 hours is 
going to be extremely hard and problematic, but I always took it to mean you have to contact the tenant within 24 hours, not actually arrange the access for less than 24 hours from when you right. did it. Hopefully this rewording might do that, but we can talk about if if Rob's got a how many days, I don't know what the town normally does for, you know, when they contact an owner about an inspection. No, I think that's fine. In fact, I mean, I can see now we can read this a couple of different ways, but I was reading it the way you just described it, Mandy, that the effort is being made immediately to make those arrangements. So uh, I I do think the the edit that you made helps clarify that. It was like, you're contacted, we're in there in 24 hours. Okay. Um, and so we don't we don't necessarily need to add something about what is a reasonable time frame for for establishing the the inspection date. We'll just leave that open. Well, that was a question. Sorry. I, I would, because I think it might depend. They might be arranged at different times in different various. Sometimes it might be, hey, we need to do one within the next month. Sometimes it might be, hey, we want to get in in the next week. Yeah. So that was the end of my comments. Does anyone else need to add anything? Can I make a motion? You can tell I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Please be my guest. <laughs> I move to recommend the town council adopt a uh, general bylaw 3.50 residential. <laughs> well, sorry, let me rephrase this. <laughs> I move to recommend the town council rescind general bylaw 3.50 residential rental property and replace it with general bylaw 3.50 residential rental property as amended at today's meeting. Second. <laughs> I don't think we need any more discussion then. Um, let's start with Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Councillor Ette. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. <laughs> Councillor Haneke. Aye. Pam Rooney. Aye. Unanimous. Support for moving this forward. I want to really say thank you. Thanks for keeping at it and, and keeping the feet to the fire tonight. It is definitely not nine o'clock. Um, thank you. So those will be transmitted to, all will be transmitted to GOL with a little cover letter. Dave, you have your hand up. I do too. Pardon? You know, I, just, I just wanted to ask about implementation dates and schedules. When, when will you be talking about that or who, meaning? We, we would anticipate it, it has to go to council. It has to have, I think it needs two readings because it, people, people don't remember it from, oh, you know. How no, I meant, I meant the program implementation when the bylaw would be effective and, and whether you wanted to hear from Rob on you know, kind of an implementation plan, that kind of thing. Sure. Mandy, do you want to say something other than I'll, I'll say two things. The first one was this referral was only to us. It goes directly to council. Um, council can decide whether it needs to go back to GOL, but but the residential rental property one, because it was already at council and had a GOL review, is slated based on the December referral to go directly back to council for what I believe the president and vice president and clerk are assuming as a second reading, but obviously they can decide and all because we've already technically had the first reading. Um, and after that reading, it was referred back for some changes based on comments. So it could be a second reading. I don't know what they'll do. Um, it's probably still posted on the website. So I will get you all of the documents we've recommended today in an email, Pam. Secondly, when CRC first made this recommendation, it voted to recommend 
that the bylaw regulations and fee structure be effective April 1 of this year. Um, we obviously could revisit that and I'd love to hear from Rob given this couple month delay on when we expected a second reading and vote to occur, what his thoughts are, but there is already a CRC recommendation that these bylaws be effective April 1 which might not be potentially possible right now, but um, we can get close to April 1 if it's a second reading on March 18th, but who knows whether that's happening. And I'd love to hear from Rob on recommendation. So one other question, Mandy, does it go back to finance because we changed the proposed fee schedule and um, relying on the strategic partnership money that we weren't talking about with them before? Um, that's up to council. That is okay. Um, so otherwise, uh, I, you know, I definitely would like time to put together an implementation plan. It is not something that's going to happen, you know, for this renewal for July 1st, there's no way we would be ready. Uh, so there's a couple ways to think about that. Do we just put it off till the next July 1st or do we phase in the first round uh you know over a longer period than one year and started off as soon as we're ready later this year uh so i can think about that some more if it's not part of crc's recommendation to the council they you know I'll, I'll definitely try to be prepared for the council meeting to discuss that um have some thoughts but you know not i guess ready until i have an idea of when we might be adopting this Thank you. I was I was thinking as you said that that we have a proposal for uh, essentially a reduction in the fees, and that I would I think a lot of people would appreciate if the fees were were uh, adjusted according to what we're suggesting, um, even ahead of time. I don't know if that's possible, Mandy. Um. That might be possible. We should look at the current fee schedule that we adopted. Um, if, yeah, it would have to be adopted under the current bylaw, not a future impending bylaw. So it might require two votes if we want to change that. Um, but I have, I personally have no need myself to continue keeping a recommended adoption or effective date at CRC before this goes to council. But council, when it votes the bylaw, the bylaw is effective 14 days after it votes, unless it votes a different date. So Rob, if you want a different date, you should probably work with Dave and Paul and Lynn and Anna about when to set this up for the next reading so that you know what effective date to ask for in the motion unless CRC wants to wait before it forwards it on so it can ask for a specific effective date. But whatever date and phase in you would want should be part of the motion to adopt. Otherwise, it's technically in effect two weeks after we vote. Rob and then Jennifer. So my question to that, Mandy, is do we have to do that? Do we have to have that date figured out? You know, if the bylaw becomes effective 14 days later, wouldn't I just issue all conditional appointments, uh, conditional permits on July 1st? And as we, whenever I, whenever we have the staff, the system, everything built, say it's September or January, I don't know, that's when we start our, you know, first scheduling of inspections, the five-year cycle for any permit holder starts from that point for the inspection purposes. So we're just, I mean, I think but, the fee reduction is something to consider. Will we actually be losing too much revenue because we're not doing the fees in the first nine months perhaps? Um, but I'm not sure if we have to try to figure out a date that I can't really figure out a date for. I mean, we're talking about hiring three new staff uh, IT services, schedules for HR, schedules for fine, you know, there's just a lot of things here to try to figure out. If we're going to have to do that, I'm probably going to say July of 25, you know, is going to be the realistic date uh, to make sure that we have time to get everything set up. Okay. 
Yeah. So I just was going to ask, I mean, can we pass a bylaw if it's passed? Can we say with implementation, you know, July 1st, 2025? So it's not a state law that it has to go into effect 14 days later, or is it? I mean, can we? It's a charter. It's charter. a charter, but we can pick a different, unless a different effective date is voted at time of adoption. So since it's not going to the council, I mean, could Rob come back with the recommended date you would like us to have by the time it has to be posted in the council packet? You know, so you don't, we don't have to vote on that tonight. We would could do that when it goes before the council. I mean, would that give you enough time to give us a date for implementation to begin implementation? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suggest that we not decide that tonight. Um, that gives Rob and Dave a bit of time to just think that through, and then we can strategize. I think I would like to get this package wrapped up and ready to go to council or GOL, whoever it, go, it goes to, with this kind of consideration. I'm not opposed to, to Rob's statement that we, we just changed the wording on conditional permits. And those are all those permits who have not yet been scheduled for, um, for, for inspection. That could in fact happen at any time, right? If they're just all conditional permits, Mandy. And then I think- So the, to... yeah, the only caution I have for Rob's comment of, could we just pass it, have it start 15, 14 days later and then conditional permits just issue initially um, is I'd want Rob to consider of the bylaw section I one C <laughs> um, that says all residential rental property that has a residential permit on the effective date shall undergo an inspection within five years of the effective date. So if we pass it, say, at our March 18th meeting, which is highly unlikely, um, given scheduling going on right now. But say we did that, the effective date would be 14 days later unless we set a new one. That means the five-year timeline for all current permit holders would start then. And it sounds like maybe you're not quite ready for the five-year timeline to start now. And that that's where I would caution us adopting this without sort of knowing when Rob's ready for that five-year timeline to start. Because I think the effective date should probably be whenever inspection services is ready for that five-year timeline to start, or we could change the five-year timeline in the bylaw to six-year timeline or something. Rob. If you, if you think that a conditional appointment still couldn't be issued after that five years, then, then we may want to consider changing that um, I do think it'd be valuable to have everything else this bylaw offers available as soon as possible. I mean, these are things with enforcement and um, dealing with problem properties that we could be utilizing immediately, even if we don't have the, the structure in place for the inspection component. Uh, maybe there's a way to specify that in the adoption that it, the inspection gets rolled out over a period of time. And I can think about that as well. And then I'm also thinking, I've got to propose a budget to the town manager, you know, for to support this program. Is that going to happen now? Am I doing that in this budget cycle? You know, is that going to take to July 1st or longer? Is it a special uh, appropriate, you know, adoption by the council to fund the budget, depending on the timing? I don't, there's just a lot of things there that, um, you know, Dave and I can work on and try to have maybe better information next time about implementation. That would be really helpful. So let's let's plan for the meeting of. Um, uh, it looks like March twelve is our next meeting. Somebody can correct me. I think that's right. Um, let's have that as a primary uh, conversation, and work through those kinds of details. Thank you, everybody. Um, let's try to wrap this up. We have no minutes. I have no announcements at this point. Next agenda preview, um, we are going to scratch nuisance bylaw, rental registration bylaw, 
and we can talk briefly about the solar bylaw process. And I think I would like to, to bring that up. So that's definitely an item. And then we'll add as, as the next agenda also just a, a solid discussion on implementation, okay? Um, there were no items anticipated uh, 48 hours in advance. And I, unless anyone objects, would like to adjourn the meeting. And thanks for your patience and sticking with this. It's really helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Rob and Dave. And I, yeah, thank you, Rob, Dave. Yeah. And Dave. Yes. And let's and let's get the meeting minutes posted and um and those recordings up so people can get at them. See you later. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Good night.